Teknolojik sıçrama, yüksek teknoloji ile dijital çağa uyum teması ile düzenlenen TÜSİAD Dijital Türkiye Konferansı tüm hızıyla devam ediyor. Şimdi çok değerli bir ismi sahneye davet edeceğim. Geleceği dönüştürmek teması ile konuşmasını yapmak üzere NASA AI ve İnovasyon Baş Danışmanı Omar Hatemli'yi sahneye davet ediyorum. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be amongst you here to speak to you about some of the things that are happening in the future, currently artificial intelligence and, and all that stuff. Can you believe what's happened just in the last year with the emergence of this uh, chat GPT, large language models and so on? It became a race for artificial intelligence. A lot of companies that were working on similar products, now they introduced them as fast as possible because it became a race and everybody's trying to introduce everything they're trying to do. Now the problem is when you're trying to introduce things that are fast, sometimes you have to be careful with the guardrails. These things have profound implications on society. So we need to make sure they are safe and properly regulated and they actually have good impacts on society. Now artificial intelligence is not something new. It's something we've been having since, and discussing since 1956. What's different this time is that you don't need to have technical capability to understand and being able to use artificial intelligence. Anybody with that technical knowledge can be able to do that, and that's the power of it. The next evolution will be much, um, become, these two will become much more complex, and then the real change will be when we combine this artificial intelligence with quantum computers, and that's when change uh, will happen at a different pace. Now, a lot of people are starting to worry about all these emerging things. How is it going to affect my job? If you're a government, for example, if you're industry, if you're an individual person, everybody's starting to get concerned how these tools are going to affect everything we work on. In, in fact, you know, society, the privacy, our jobs, and so on. So it's, it's something cross-cutting that everybody's looking about. And it reminds us what happened in, in the Industrial Revolution. But the Industrial Revolution actually it disrupted some jobs, but ended up creating substantially more jobs. What's different this time is, is we're not only competing with manual labor, we're competing for the first time in history with intellect. So if there's any job in the market right now, um, it's going to be disrupted potentially with some kind of these technologies. The transition we see is actually a person using artificial intelligence will be able to do their job much, much better, much more efficient, faster. As these things become more advanced and evolve further in the future, then the potential will be to comp completely disrupt some of these jobs. Look at a primary care physician. Primary care physician, they see tens and tens of doctors every day. And sometimes they don't have time to be able to get everything you need and, and get all the information from patients. And sometimes there is a misdiagnosis element that comes with that. With the emergence of these extremely advanced tools, you'll be able to do a much better diagnosis, uh, same thing with engineers, with lawyers, with finance people, it's cross-cutting across every single place. Now, every single thing you're seeing here is just a baby stage. So people say, well, you know, AI can do this, can do that. It's just a baby, it's just an infant. We are the weak artificial intelligence phase. Just wait until we go into the general artificial intelligence and then eventually into super artificial intelligence, and that's a game changer. These systems will be able to replicate themselves, to change themselves, to be able to do things beyond human control. They will have the, the, the intellectual capability of, of tens of billions of people, and that's a game changer for sure. Now, something very important is also ethics. So we need to make sure we have fair, transparent, accountable, uh, safe, secure uh, guidelines that, that govern these kind of things. These things are very dangerous if we lift them on their own. So we need to properly govern them and make sure everything is okay. I want you to consider this scenario here for ethics and, and just to show you how complex things are. So imagine there's a driverless car driving behind the truck. And then there is a box in the, in the truck, falls on the street. So the car has to make a decision. Which one has priority? Do I save the person in the car or do I save people outside? So the car looks on the right, it sees a motorcycle and a, and a person not wearing a helmet. It looks on the right, on the left, and there's another person on a motorcycle, but this person wearing a helmet. So obviously, if you impact the one with the helmet, he has a better success of, of living, uh, of, of survival. 
but what does that mean? What means somebody's wearing a helmet and he's complying with the, with the regulations, he has be impacted by that. Now again, let's say both of them are wearing helmets. One is older, one is a teenager. Which one do I go toward? It's very complex. So I think sometimes ethical implications are more complex to solve than technological complications. So this is something we need to work on and make sure we solve properly, uh, continuously. Bias is very important as well. Um, so before I, I was working on this presentation, I just wanted to see one of these um, image generating systems with AI and how biased they are. So I told them 10 times approximately, draw me a picture of a nurse. And 10 out of time, it drew a woman. I told the same story, I say a doctor, a maid, a CEO, an em unemployed person, a gangster. And you can see the incredible bias that exists in these systems. Now AI is not good, AI is not bad, AI is not biased. It's just what data is learning on is what produces everything else. And again, we go to the infant analogy. If we're giving a curriculum to, a, to an infant, that's what he's going to learn, and that's what he's going to grow up to be. So we need to be very careful how we're grounding these systems in one data, so when they grow up, they become you know, the, the elements that we're looking at. Um, it's the way we regulate these things are going to be very different than the way we've, we've regulated everything. Uh, it's moving at such a past phase that by the time we're regulating it, it's going to change, it's going to evolve, and it has to be a delicate balance. We cannot put too much regulations on policies and then stifle innovation. It has to be a, a good, good balance between all of them. And we need to find a way that's different than anything we've done to regulate these systems. Now, robotic systems, humanoid robots specifically, there's a lot of work uh, being done with corporations. A lot of it's not even known yet. But these systems are getting very advanced. They're getting very dexterous. They're getting very capable. And then once you combine them with artificial intelligence, they're changing the game completely, especially something we call collective learning. Look at, let's say, for example, as individuals, whatever we learn, we just learn it ourselves. But let's say, for example, you have a million cars on the streets. Whatever one single car learns, a million cars will learn it at the same time. Can you imagine the power of learning, how exponential these things will be able to learn and move forward? It's beyond anything we've done before. The fundamental foundations that we've lived with before, for example, the Asimov laws, it, ten, it says that a robot might not injure a human. And I think all these laws have to be revisited because they're different. What if this humanoid robot, for example, is a surgeon, and a surgeon had to put an incision in a human? Then obviously, by definition, it's, it's hurting a human, even though it's for the better good for curing him. But we have to, it doesn't comply, it, it conflicts with the laws of Asimov. So we need to fundamentally change these thing, kind of things. Uh, human rights, is, I mean, robotic rights is something we've been talking about a lot. And it seems like a joke. What do you mean uh, robots having rights? But let, let me show you this quick parody by, by Boston Dynamic. I'll just ask you a question after that. Just by show of hand, how many people felt bad for that thing? And you know, we know it's not even a human, it's just uh, bolts, rods. Now when that thing, when that robot looks like this, when that robot has, has a personality, when that robot engages with you at a level that there's no other human will engage with you, it's a different story. So it's not as simple as it seems. Robotics rights is something we need to carefully look at and how they're gonna be evolving forward from, moving from here. Now, what is artificial intelligence impact on, on the population increase? So the UN estimates we're gonna have about you know, 10 billion people by the year 2050, but that doesn't take into account the four fundamental pillars in, in technology that we're looking at. They'll just look at dynamic, at static models, how many people are, are, are being born, how many people are dying in different continents. It doesn't account for all these very important ones. So for the first time in history, we're understanding to understand what are the hallmarks of aging? What causes humans to age? As a matter of fact, aging has been classified as a disease. That means that one way we potentially could slow it down or even stop it altogether one, one time. Whether we're talking about telomere shortening, senescent cells, 
was talking about you know, stem cell depletion, epigenetic noises. We, we know all these kind of things, and we're finding mechanisms of action to be able to slow all these kind of things. Artificial intelligence, once we combine it with quantum computers, we'll be able to do a digital twin on every human based on a genetic composition. So I'll give you a medication that's 100% tailored just for you, not nobody else, and will be 100% effective. The next phase will be predicting a disease before you even have a disease. Like, for example, it can run models based on so many different elements on biology, on, on genetics, family history, blood chemistry, and so on, enzymes, and tells you that in a certain amount of time, you're going to have a specific disease, and then tackle that disease before you even have it. That's taking it to a whole different level. We'll be able to print 3D organs based on the genetic composition with no chances of rejections. And then a little bit further, we're going to actually work with nanobots, which can augment your immunity system and being able to help you live much, much longer. So what does that mean? You know, if people start living 130, 140, 150, what is the economic impact? What is the, there is impact on, on retirement systems. Retirement systems are based on average lifespan, 75, 80. If people start living to 140, 130, and so on, then they collapse completely. They don't, they don't sustain themselves. If we actually, in the 20, 25 years, when the vast majority of the jobs will be done with extreme advanced intelligence, artificial intelligence systems, whether we're talking about blue collar or white collar, we're talking about you know, intellectual jobs, or we're talking about manual jobs done by advanced, extremely humanoid robots, um, it's, it's a different story. So how is the future economy look like? Is it going to be universal basic income? I don't know. Uh, it's going to be a challenge to find out what is that evolution of the economic system that we have and how can we from today start thinking about them to actually when we get to that point to understand exactly how to deal with it. Compensation, productivity is something I've been looking for at, uh, for a while as well. Until the 70s, compensation and productivity used to be more or less in the same line. But since the 70s, especially now, productivity is going on exponentially. We're, we're producing way more than we used to before. But again, compensation is not catching up with it. The work week, you know, the eight hours a day. Do you know that eight hours a day was established in 1916? Can you believe 1916, over 100 years ago? And we are, I would say, orders, orders and orders of magnitude more productive in so many things. But we're still working eight hours a day. We're still working five days a week. I think it's time to relook at all these kind of elements and see what is the evolution of that. But also these kind of things will affect the state of society, the interactions between humans. You know, uh, my generation, we used to interact with people face to face. The new one, the younger one, they communicate with each other with social media, with electronic means. And the future generations will be communicating with artificial intelligence systems way more than they communicate with people. When this, pe when this system knows your personality 100%, you know, knows more about you than you know about yourself and engages with you on a whole different level. That is very powerful. But at the same time, you need to be careful about cybersecurity. If these systems are, are hacked or the corporations dividing these systems can have an influence on you, they can influence in, on you on who to vote for, what products to buy, what philosophies to adapt. So it comes with advantages and disadvantages and we need to be careful about where everything's going on. But humans as well are evolving physically. Imagine spending years just hunching down like this, typing a computer. Imagine spending 20, 30, 40 years of your, of your life just in, working with thumbs, your vision. All these things have a big impact. And the one I'm worried about the most is the impact on the brain. So they've done studies uh, that says people after a certain age, when they stop driving, their cognitive ability went down substantially. So what does that mean? When, what, what does that mean when the majority of transportation will happen with autonomous cars? when the majority of the decisions will be made by artificial intelligence. What is the impact on the human brain or on intellect? Is it going to be diminishing as we move forward? What is that Im affects humanity overall? Important questions to work on. But at the same time, we're having a big challenge with academic institutions. We're graduating people that are not ready for the work market. Things are moving so fast that if you go to a five-year engineering degree, by the time you graduate, you're completely off. You know, industry have done so many things that the academic curriculums are not capable of doing that. So we need to build bridges and completely change and disrupt the way we do actually education to be able to do all these kind of things. The cool thing is also lines are blurring between um, uh, industries. Before, a technology that used to be applicable for one industry, it used to be only for that. 
And the thing is now it applies across the board. Look at 3D printing. We can do engines. We can do houses. You know, we can do clothing. We can do organs. We can do food. And that is the power of transversality in technology, that all of us can work on, on together to, to develop these things. And everybody brings a different perspective, more funding, more resources. So collectively, we produce much better things. Something very, very important we need to evaluate and think about. As humans, we evolved to think in a linear fashion. We were farmers. We were hunters. We, things moved very slowly. That is not the case anymore. Everything is moving at such a rate, that exponential rate, that we're not equipped as humans to think in that capacity. We definitely need to find ways how to fill the gap between linearity and exponentiality. And the, the sooner we do that, the more relevant we're going to be as a human race. The skills and everything that made us successful until now, it's not necessarily what's going to be successful in the future. And that is one of the biggest impediments. Well, this is the same way we've been doing it for 20, 30 years. There's no change. There is no need for change. If you imply this philosophy, you're going to be completely out of the market. So you have to be able to do these kind of things. And then we're, we're strategizing about the future. Don't limit yourself with, with, the, with the challenges we have today. If you're doing a strategy for five years, just see how everything is evolving. And then embark on that journey, and then that will give you a much better idea how to do things and strategize about the future. You need to engage with startups. Sometimes corporations do um, you know, millions of dollars and years trying to develop solutions. In fact, these solutions already exist in somebody else's garage. Just finding the way to connect with venture capital groups that will tell you what's happening at the a startup will make a di big difference. We need to be visionaries. We need to connect the dots in ways we haven't done before, in a very different way. And that will give us a big dis uh, advantage. Diversity is also very important. Group think is really, really bad. I can be sitting with a group with 20 or 30 engineers, and believe me, the solutions will be pretty much the same. So the more you diversify your team, the better off you'll be. And just to give you a quick example here, so this is a bike company in the Netherlands. And the challenge is, this is a, an electric bike, so when it was being shipped, the majority of these bikes were coming back damaged. So the, the company was, went out of business almost. And of course, you know, they brought the technical people, the engineers. What do you do as an engineer? Well, let's make this uh, section thicker. Let's change it from plastic to metal. That's what engineers do. And then another person who's not a technical person said, well, instead of doing all the stuff, why don't we just print a copy of a TV on the box? And by doing that, people will think they're transporting TVs instead of bicycles. They'll pay much more attention. Something that costs like five cents saved the whole company. And believe me, that will never come from an engineer. That will come from all person that thinks outside of the box. Another, another example, this, this is a potato chip company. They were trying to actually um, solve a problem. When they're, shaking the, when they're producing these potatoes, typically to remove the grease, they, they end up shaking them. And the challenge is, you know, a lot of pieces get broken. So when you open a potato chip bag, it's a lot of broken pieces, it doesn't look appealing. You're not going to believe where the solution came from. It's just almost impossible to think about. It came from a violinist. So a violinist was, was playing a melody, and he noticed when he, when he plays a certain note, that note resonates with the natural frequency of the grease, and it displaces the grease with, without affecting the structural integrity of the potato. Who in the world would have thought that was a solution? I mean, it's impossible. And there's the power of, of breaking away from groupthink, the power of diversity, and looking for solutions completely outside places. Acceptation is also very, very important. It's a biological term, actually. It, it, it refers to something that was invented uh, or created for a function, and then it was co-opted for a whole different use. And basically, the feathers and the birds were never intended for flying. Feathers were evolved for thermoregulation, and then colors were, Im were evolved for mating and so on, but then were never intended for flying. But eventually, they were co-opted, they were using for flying. And it, that is the same thing we need to do. We need to look into patents where technologies that are invented or created for one function and then use a completely different way of looking at it to create value in other domains. That will be a huge source of revenue and income. If we don't take risk, that means we're not going to do anything. The key here, the challenge, is being proactive. The minute you're reactive, you're gone. You're out. We're living in a fast pace that unless you're being proactive, you're not going to be relevant at all in the, in the, the future ecosystem. Um, and, and, and something you know about creativity that I always think about, imagine who are the most creative creatures? It's kindergartners. They have an amazing imagination. They can think about things that are insane. 
even um, the, the spaghetti challenge, I don't know if you know the spaghetti challenge is something that they give you a number of spaghettis and rope and you're supposed to build the tallest one. The highest group that built better than CEOs were kindergartners. We are so, they are so creative. The problem is, in society, they keep growing up, we keep putting impediment, we keep saying, no, this is difficult, you cannot do that. Oh, this is impossible, this is for smart people. So we put them back in the boxes. And then what's, what's ironic, we spend so much money training people to get out of the box. Why don't we just skip the middle part and, and change the whole thing that we deal with these kind of elements? Uh, the same thing is also environment. If we want to be successful, we need to adopt a very in different environment that actually enable us to be successful, creative, out of the box thinkers, think in orthogonal terms. And I was watching a documentary on Netflix, and this gentleman, he ap apparently produces the best soy sauce in the world. And they ask him, how come you are the one that produces the best in the world? Nobody else was able to do that. And the guy said, I really don't. I don't do anything. The only thing I do is create the right environment, and the microorganisms do everything. Isn't that what we need to do? We, can, we have to create the right environments, and things will happen organically in the organizations, and it's a big change. But also I was thinking, even as simple as, as the way we refer to things in our environments, we call, I'm a manager, I'm a director, you know, I'm a supervisor, so I'm supervising you, I'm managing you. It's like, if you think about them, they are kind of demeaning terms. Why don't we change these terms to something more forthgoing, like everything is enabled, like I'm the enabler, and, you know, empowerer, facilitators. By fact, it, it changes the narrative and the, the col collaboration between the, the, the, the ecosystem and organization to go to a different place. Uh, and then we need to work as an ecosystem. When you look at forest, forest is actually, they're, they're not individual um, uh, trees. They're, they're a whole in mechanism. And they communicate with the fungus underneath it called um, a microwave of fungus, and they, uh, they can transfer nutrition, they can communicate with each other and do sort of amazing things. And that's the same thing we need to do, actually, with, with everything we work on. We need to work with industry, with academia, with government, and work as an ecosystem to be able to solve a lot of the challenges. When astronauts go into space, they don't see, uh, you know, countries. They don't see borders. They see a beautiful, country, you know, planet, and that's called the overview effect. And that's the same thing we need to do as executives and managers and directors. We need to actually th see what's happening um, geopolitically, what's happening economically, what's happening technologically, and then go back and you'll be able to have very different perspective on everything that's happening. When we talk about the future, there is no single future. There's multiple futures. Which future we end up taking depends on each and every single one of us. So imagine if we put our collective intellect to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. I think the possibilities will be endless. Thank you very much.